Hi, my name is Benedict Tegima. I'm a senior software engineer at Andela. I program in Java, PHP, Scala, and JavaScript. And in this short video, we're going to look at the qualities and patterns that make up a well-engineered API client. Isn't it awesome when you can shop on Amazon or Alibaba using your local bank or PayPal account? How about selecting your destination from within Uber without having to get the coordinates from Google Maps? That's awesome. As you develop a web application, I bet you'd want your users to have a similar experience that you've had from these other sites. This involves building or using existing APIs that can enable your application to communicate with another. The downside is that now your application has to rely on a third-party API. Any failures in the third-party API will frustrate your users. You cannot control the third-party API, but you can control your application's response to these unexpected behaviors so that you continue delighting your users. APIs, or Application Programming Interfaces, are a vital component of the tech revolution. They allow capabilities of one web application to be used by another. An API client could be any of the following. A mobile app sending requests to a backend API to fulfill a user's request. Say a user wants to view transaction details in an e-commerce app. A web app sending requests to a third-party API, say to validate a user. Picture a, a, a university admission system that takes students' national ID numbers and validates them against a government API. It could just simply be one microservice sending a request to another. In this video, we'll look at some common pitfalls that can make our API clients brittle and not so resilient. If you have ever built and deployed an application that is consuming critical APIs into production, then you surely have learned out of experience or the hard way to deal with these pitfalls. But if you haven't, then you'll benefit. Let's go ahead and explore this. The examples we're going to use in this video are Java code examples. But you don't have to learn or know Java programming because we shall not be focusing on the syntax, but we shall rather focus on concepts that cut across all programming languages. Now back to the pitfalls. Uh, we're going to look at transport exceptions and HTTP status codes. Transport exception is a type of exception that mostly happens as a result of failures or delays at the network level. And these propagate back into your application and present as input-output exceptions or I.O. failures. An example of a transport exception is connection timeout exception. A network, by its nature, is unreliable. So sometimes your application may try to reach a server but it takes longer than is acceptable to connect. The maximum time allowed for an application to connect to the server is usually configured in the programming environment. Another example of a transport exception is a read timeout, similar to a connection timeout, but it happens when a connection has already been made to the server and an API call has been made, but it's taking longer than is acceptable to respond with data. Now, we're going to take a look at two blocks of code, one properly equipped to handle transport exceptions, while the other, not so much. In looking at the two blocks of code on the screen, we can see that the first one uses a generic exception class, which is not so right. And it also does not explicitly set connection and read timeout values but rather relies on the system defaults. While the second one uses a specific or custom exception class, it explicitly sets connection and read timeout values. Now, I understand that not all languages are strongly typed like Java. For example, JavaScript and PHP. In such cases, make sure you create a custom exception class or just search online for similar patterns. 
the most important concept is that your coach should be able to understand the exact cause of a failure and handle it. In order to properly handle an error, your app should define its own time limits for connection and response. It should be able to discern between a connect timeout or a read timeout. This information is critical to failure recovery. If a connection timed out, you can just retry using either Jitta or exponential backup strategy. So exponential backup strategy is a common approach to retrying failed API calls, where the retrial is done after exponential increasing intervals of time. For example, if you want your application to retry five times, then you could retry after one second, two seconds, four seconds, then go to eight seconds, and finally to 16 seconds before giving up. Jitter is an improvement of exponential backup strategy to avoid too much load on a server. In this case, you retry after random intervals of time so that not all applications are retrying at the same time. If it's a read timeout, retry for inimportant methods. In important methods or APIs are endpoints which, even if you call one time, two times, five times, ten times, the effect is the same as calling it once. For non important APIs, where each call leaves the server in a different state, don't retry right away. First query the status of the initial call to know did it succeed or did it fail before you can decide to retry or cancel. Now, let's talk about HTTP status codes, which are sent by the server in response to client requests sent to the server. They have been around for a long time, but many API clients malfunction due to improper handling of these codes. When you receive codes in the 100 range, those are just informational codes. In the 200 range, that shows success. In the 300 range, it shows redirection. In the 400 range, you should know that your request has an, a problem. The syntax is wrong. Then the 500 range shows the server encountered an error, but your request is correct. Now let's compare the following snippets of code. In the first snippet, we're only logging the status code and a message, which is totally not sufficient. In the second, we look out for specific HTTP status codes and do some action accordingly. For example, status 500, you could just retry, like a read timeout. Status 400 should be escalated for manual intervention. That means there's a problem in your request. Status 401 could mean that your authorization token expired and the server no longer recognizes you. You use this as a trigger to request for a new token. Status 403 should be escalated for manual intervention. It means you're not authorized to access some resources. You may need to reach the server owner. Don't assume that the server will only return documented responses like JSON or XML. Sometimes the server response may be erroneously empty or gibberish that you can't understand. For example, status 500 could be accompanied by HTML in the response instead of JSON. So use the error thrown by the JSON or XML parser to return an appropriate action after this. In this video, we've explored some techniques to help your API client properly handle the very unpredictable nature of a production environment. Some of these techniques seem subtle and sometimes complex or difficult to implement, but they can cause non-trivial bugs and failures. So by adhering to these techniques, you should be able to build robust API clients that will not break when undocumented behavior shows up in your system. If you want to learn more, I've dropped some links in the description below. Feel free also to continue interacting with me about this video and more via Twitter. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe.